much the extent of my humor. It's going to be dry. It's going to be sarcastic. Um, I, I, I noticed from the hashtag you all were talking about branding and storytelling and, and all sorts of stuff. And I thought to myself, well, gosh, they've been covering a lot of material already. What is it that, that I can add to this discussion? What is it that I can add to uh, the, the narrative? And I, I think that uh, one of my recent pieces for InsideHigherEd.com was about how individuals can use um, their social media channels uh, as professionals, even though they're, they're sort of their, it's a personal account, if you will. Um, I think with, with regards to our social media channels and our social media engagement, uh, the lines blur a little bit between personal and professional. And I think our digital identity, it, it really, it sort of spans and sort of runs the gamut of, of our personal lives, our professional lives and everything in between. And, and I think with, regards to what you all are doing with libraries and strategic communications within libraries, uh, it, it's very similar to any type of communications that you would do in any space, be it a branding space, a marketing communication space at the overall institution, the overall university. And yet the, the true power of, of social media is that social aspect of it. And every time I interact with a brand or every time I interact with an institution or a student interacts with a brand or an institution or you interact with a brand or an institution, the, 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 the sort of key differentiator is when you're actually connecting with another human being. And, and that digital identity component is so powerful in that regard because you are connecting with another human being. And that's the great thing about social media is that you all can be on the social channels, connecting with students, connecting with faculty, connecting with staff, yeah, you might have the, you know, the library of XYZ uh, Twitter account, or you might have the YouTube channel, but there's also going to be those individual accounts that you're using. And oftentimes what we've seen is that that resonates a lot more with people because it's got the human context uh, in connection with it. And so that's really the sort of the, the theme of my slides, sort of, yes, the, the context, the, the, the subject matter is strategic communications but your personal digital identity, which is, is essentially the same as your, your professional digital identity. I, I find that those of us that, that tweet and share and post um, sort of ourselves, uh, so it's a bit of work stuff, it's a bit of home stuff, um, are much more uh, easy to connect with. It resonates a lot more. Uh, and so when you're thinking about strategic communications, uh, think about that bridge, that bridge between your single account as an individual to the constituencies that you serve uh, in addition to your major branding, major storytelling channels, because you, you're still gonna have sort of more power because of the masses. Um, it's, it's sort of the, the, the idea is, you know, back in the day when it was old school Batman, you had the, the red phone, you know, and there was only that single red phone and only one person could send and receive calls. And, and now with social, it's a team effort. Uh, and, and that team effort allows you to expand the reach of your story, expand the reach of what you're trying to do. And at the end of the day, it really humanizes the library. You know, the library is many things. The library in the, in the minds and sort of hearts and minds of people is this, this physical space, but it's also a digital space. And it's also made up of a tremendous team and or teams of people who provide a variety of services, who provide a, a variety of wisdom and knowledge, and, and every one of them has their own sort of nuance and individual style of how they communicate. And you think about sort of when you're a student or your faculty or you're a member of the community, you're going to connect with whoever you connect with. You might not even connect with the primary library channels because you have sort of gotten more of an interest in what so-and-so is doing because they're sharing stuff that, that aligns just more with sort of that vibe that, that you have. I, I'm loving the the tweets here. So thank you for all the the Twitter uh, the Twitter chatter, if you will. The the Twitter Roddy in the room are are doing a great job. Yep, all the tweeples. Yeah, I know it's really it's really some bad some bad jokes today. But um, so anyway, uh, the other thing is sort of the idea of the plan. Um, I, I know that there was a, a tweet that went out earlier uh, that was saying, you know, hey, it's not necessarily all about the plan. Uh, because having a plan from a strategic communications context, uh, it might be a bit too rigid. It might be a bit too staid. Uh, however, I find that when I walk into an organization, whenever I'm consulting at an institution or you know, college or a university or at a business, and we start talking about social media, one of the things I always ask is, what's your plan? And, and I, don't, I don't mind if it's, you know, it's sort of loose and it's, it's sort of an ever-evolving thing, but having some structure in place around 
sort of what you're all trying to do, maybe having regular meetings to talk about what you're trying to accomplish, what's working, what's not, sort of sharing best practices, sharing, you know, hey, why is so-and-so getting all the, you know, the connections, the mentions, the interactions? What's, what are they doing differently than everybody else? Um, having some sort of plan in place is useful, especially when you think about sort of live uh, synchronous events where you want to have you know, people tweeting and almost providing coverage, you know, maybe they're live broadcasting on YouTube or something, you want to have sort of all hands on deck. And so maybe it's not necessarily a plan that is rigid and fixed for the entire year, or the semester or the quarter, but at least you have an idea that, hey, when we need everybody on deck for some sort of social media endeavor, we, we know what's going to happen. We, and, and the same goes for not just sort of the feel good events, but also for uh, crisis communications, you know, uh, the primary university Marcom channels obviously have crisis communications under their purview, but at the same time, if I'm a student and I'm following several members of the, the library staff, the, the communications folk for the library, uh, I want to make sure you're telling me stuff as well if, if there's something that's going on. And so uh, the plan piece is very important from a variety of sort of you know synchronous events, special occasions, uh, campaign rollouts for different things, different services, different uh, features, new you know new facilities, that kind of thing, uh, to the to the the sort of uh, crisis on the ground type event. Unfortunately, I, I like you can all can sort of see my slides ahead of time, so you're sort of you know cheating. Um, I'm going to send all of you to a student conduct meeting after this. Uh, and you will hereby be uh, adjudicated for this. Um, I put up this slide, you know, when we talk about doing social media, a lot of times people will say, you know, it's part of the hustle. And, and hustle is one of those words that, you know, gets sort of thrown around. And it's got a bit of a uh, reputation and whatnot. Just I sort of define hustle as, as the amount of time and energy that you put into using social media for whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. And, and I think that that's really what it comes down to is spending enough time to adequately get, to sort of get good at the tools, uh, create sort of those connections with people, um, learn the different tools, learn the different channels, figure out what you're doing with it. Uh, you know, I always say that it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you walked into Home Depot uh, and you bought just every sort of tool imaginable and a lot of supplies, uh, but you weren't a carpenter. You'd never actually built anything before. You know, you, you sort of have to learn how to use the tools first before you can think about how to use them tactically, how, to, how you can use them uh, as a sort of critical mass of folks. And so spend some time and, and allocate some time. Because, I mean, think about it this way. How many of you got up this morning and checked email? And it's okay. You can raise your hands. Yeah, I can, I can see. I've got a little teeny tiny thumbnail. But, you know... In higher education, we're all paid email checkers. It's part of our salary. We, we check email on a regular basis. We've embedded the sort of art and act of email into our, our daily lives. And the same thing goes with social. You know, you've got to embed it into your daily routine from checking it, connecting, um, learning, and, 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 you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like a party, right? If you, if you go into a party, and you start talking about yourself, no one's going to pay attention to you because it's not a social thing. You know, you're not creating any sense of community. You're just sort of being this, this narcissistic ego person over here. You know, you got to go in and listen to what folks are saying and, and spend some time with it. Now, the cool thing about that is once you've spent some time with it, the two things that can happen. One, you start to acquire knowledge. You acquire knowledge of how these tools, how these technologies work. And I always say that librarians are sort of on the cutting edge anyway in higher education when it comes to learning and technology uh, and just sort of that, you know, when you think about sort of where's the heart of disruption in, in an institution, you know, I come from a traditional student affairs background and I can tell you it, disruption and technology competency is not coming out of student affairs and it's not necessarily coming out of academic affairs. I, I think it's coming out of libraries. And, and there's sort of this huge sort of spinning ball of knowledge when it comes to libraries and librarians and what you're doing. And so with social media, I love the fact that when you're using social media, you're, you're learning the tools, but you're also sort of learning the dynamics of the community. And when you're using the tools, connecting and engaging and sharing and, and promoting and just 
communicating. The neat thing is you're teaching your community. You know, they might not realize they're being taught. They might not realize there's some knowledge exchange, some knowledge share going on there, but they're actually being taught some stuff. They're, they're sort of being taught what it's like to be human, to be personable, to have voice, to have tone, to use these tools. Um, and, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about social media is you can use the tools, communicate, convey, share, and interact. And it's all, it, it simultaneously counts as teaching because people are learning new things. And then you put that all together and you get cats with lasers. <laughs> now you put it all together and, and you, you know, you get this digital identity, you know, you get sort of a, a campus wide digital identity. And you also get the sense that, you know, when you spend as much time on digital as you do with brick and mortar, they both, both spaces become equally important. And as we've sort of learned time and time again, uh, what we do online uh, matters just as much as what we do face to face and in person, and and sometimes even more so because you know that single tweet that you push out, that single tweet could be retweeted, screenshotted, favorited. Uh, all the next thing you know, you're on CNN. So it, the sort of expansive nature of our communications now are uh, a, a little bit different than sort of our, our traditional way. And yeah, Joe, I see your paid email click uh, checkers uh, tweet that you just put out. So uh, thanks for that. I'm, I'm checking Twitter, by the way, too. It's like it's like walking, you know, chewing gum and 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 flying an X-wing fighter, and all at the same time. That's a really bad Star Wars joke. I was hoping in a room full of librarians, I could get a little nerdy. Yeah, the first cat slide of the conference. Whew, you know, we came in under the right, right at the end there. That's that's a tweet, by the way. If you're not following the tweet stream, uh, it was apparently this is the first slide of the entire event that has a cat in it. So, uh, well, for that you're welcome. And just to, just to make sure we've got our bases covered, here's another one. Uh, you know, when I when I think about social media, the the one thing about social media is that there's so many different channels. There's so many different ways to engage. There's so many different ways to connect. And, and people will ask me, so they'll say, hey, Eric, what's the best way to do it? What, which ones should we use? And I'll say, you know, in some cases, it depends on what you're trying to do. It depends on your audience, who you're trying to connect with. Uh, you know, and, at the, and the other ways, it says, hey, who, who and where uh, are your people located? You know, in terms of, is everybody on your campus on Twitter? Twitter is a great tool, but maybe they're not on Twitter, but maybe they should be. So you're going to use Twitter or maybe you want to curate some stuff. I mean, come on, you're in the library business. Curation is the, just like at the core of it all. And so you think about maybe using Pinterest or maybe you want to do some visual exploration with maybe Instagram or YouTube and you want to create some videos, or maybe you want to get into more of an international flavor with regards to your social media. And so you start to use uh, some of the, the, the social media networks that, that aren't necessarily as popular in the US, but they're available much more so over in Asia, like, like Sina Weibo, or maybe you wanna do some messaging stuff with WhatsApp. You know, brands have started to really look at the messaging space. You know, Facebook Messenger has started to evolve. Uh, WhatsApp, they bought, Facebook bought that. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on now, just the messaging stuff, this simplistic one-to-one um, -one or brand-to-one -one kind of interaction, or who knows, any libraries on Snapchat? Yeah, I mean, it's wild when you think about it, right? Because when Snapchat first came out, I bet nobody was thinking we're going to have libraries on Snapchat. But you know what? There's institutions that are doing all kinds of stuff with engagement, recruitment, marketing, uh, admissions type things, athletics type stuff with Snapchat. You know, and you think about, OK, well, we could tell stories about the library, tell stories about what you know, special collections are on offer. You can tell all kinds of stories that way. Same thing goes with YouTube. Now, how many of you recognize the, the tiny little um, creature that's just above the hashtag uh, in this slide? What is that thing? Say it a little louder. Oh, yeah, totally. So here's the, the thing. When I say this in an audience where I'm actually there in, in person, typically there's maybe like, I don't know, 10, 15% of the room will shout out Reddit. And I'll just say to people, you know, those, those are your nerds. 
they, they, have, they have clearly identified themselves. These are resources. Make sure you go and talk to them. I was just talking about Reddit today uh, with some folks up in the, or here in the UK, and we were talking about the Reddit AMAs. They ask me anything and how uh, just amazing the Reddit AMA app is in terms of curated, uh, categorized content on a variety of topics. And you think about, wow, we could do library AMAs. You could do all sorts of topic-based ask me anything. You could do, hey, ask me anything about the library. And I guarantee you, you're going to get a lot of questions. And the cool thing is, if you've built up this community, if you've built up this sense of, hey, we share good stuff through social media, then when you tweet out the link to your AMA, people are going to connect with you. People are going to actually pay attention to what's going on. Now, some of you might be using Facebook, and that's okay. But I will say this, Facebook has sort of dramatically changed the way people access content uh, on Facebook because Facebook pages has become kind of, it's become kind of a, a pay to play environment. Uh, you might have a Facebook group, which is a bit more of a closed loop. Uh, however, usage wise, there's a lot of people still on Facebook. Um, and then there's Google Plus, which we're using today for this Hangout. Uh, it hasn't really taken off, obviously, as far as the social networking aspect. Um, but still, it's got great functionality. There's the little yik yak head there, which is great. Yeah, I'm just uh, so Kay Diaz just says that I'm pandering to librarians now with the cross between cats and Star Wars. You're absolutely correct, and I, I'm I'm hopefully hitting some home runs here, and I'm, I feel right at home with this material. Um, there's also Tumblr and Vine and, and LinkedIn. I mean, the the, the cool thing really about social media and, and all the different apps and sites and services is it's always changing. It's always evolving. There's never sort of this stasis where it's it's the same forever. And, and it reminds me of a library, right? A library is sort of this, this breathing, living thing where you've got lots of stuff happening. There's always change occurring, new material, new people, new resources, new ways to access it, new technologies. And, and I think that sort of that ethos around lifelong learning that is housed in, a, in the physical space of a library as well as the digital realm of a library uh, fits really well with social media. And, and it's just, again, this is just a layer for you to tell your stories, to tell uh, what you're up to. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to try really hard not to get distracted by Twitter because it can just derail you. Speaking of that lifelong learning thing, Sometimes, you know, this is something that I run across when I'm talking to administrators, when I'm talking to senior leaders, you know, people just say that they, they just don't have time to learn social media. And, and what they're actually saying is that it's just not a priority. They're not making time. And, and, and here's the cool thing. You know, Facebook is 11 years old. I don't think it's a fad. Twitter, Twitter's been around since 2006, so it's like nine years old. It's, it's going to be coming up on its 10th birthday pretty soon. You know, so if you're still sort of saying, I'm not sure about this, one, it's not going anywhere. This stuff is here to stay for now. Two, you can always learn it. You can always figure it out. It just might take you a while. And if you, if you get intimidated by, you know, someone who's got, you know, 50,000 tweets and they've been doing it for a long time, don't worry about them. Do your thing figure it out, and, and you're going to walk the walk uh, just like your students do uh, in any type of learning uh, use case that they're going through. So it's the same exact types of scenario. Because at the end of the day, what you'd hope for is, well, you're going to be leading via social media. Because again, it's going to be this team-oriented aspect where you're all involved, you're all invested, and, and it's going to almost be sort of a game in a way. You're going to gamify your communications because you get everybody involved, you get everybody connecting, you get everybody using the channels, and then you start sharing, hey, I did this, it worked really well, you should try it. And then someone else goes out, maybe they use a GoPro camera and they do some really cool video and they put it up on YouTube and they put a nice you know, music track with it that they got from SoundCloud. I mean, it's, it's sort of, I, I love the, the first word in creative commons because it's all about being creative. And, and there's so much you can do with creative commons media in conjunction with social media. The sky's the limit. By the way, most of my images here are creative commons zero uh, images, which... Uh, you don't even have to attribute, which is pretty amazing. So I wanted to sort of just show you what a day in the life is like for me 
because it gives you this sense of sort of, you know, how do you incorporate this stuff? What's it look like? And, you know, for me, it's sort of, you know, when I, work is a generic word, obviously, it counts for email and phone calls and, and sort of meetings and um, sometimes having coffee with folks and, you know, maybe go for a run and I'll write for Inside Higher Ed and I'll go back to do some more work and then maybe I'll get on Twitter and uh, do a little bit more writing. And maybe I'm speaking at an event and maybe I'll watch some YouTube videos to learn some stuff and figure out how to do something better for the, the next video that I upload. Um, you know, incorporating it into your workflow is, is exceptionally important uh, for, for the very reason that you are a role model uh, for everyone, you know, at your community, at your campus. Uh, as Santa Ono, the University of Cincinnati president said, you know, the next generation is watching what we do on social media. It is up to us to lead them in the right direction. Now, I'm not sure if it's necessarily something we wanted to say is, or sort of quantify as the right direction, but I think it's good to provide uh, positive role modeling of, of social media. And, and I love it when people in, who are involved in strategic communications create space for positive role modeling. Uh, because again, then it's not marketing, then it's not communications. It's just, you're just existing in this space and, and being a member of the community, which again, will sort of up everyone's uh, element of digital literacy. Digital literacy is massive, obviously, in sort of the aspects of career development and employability. And, and when you think about what it is you're trying to uh, teach students and, and teach your community on a regular basis, uh, yeah, you're teaching them how to how to retrieve, how to access information, how to you know get in there and 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 find accurate citations and and just sort of you know in a, in a way be sort of that digital wayfinder. But throughout that process, you are upping everyone's digital literacy, which is massive when it comes to future employability. Which is one of those great things when you say, hey, we need some more funding, or we want to try this. You could say, guess what? We're helping people get jobs. And they'll say, wow, we never thought about it that way before. And here's the neat thing about this whole social media part is everybody's watching, right? If you get everybody to pay attention to you, you set the tone, you set the channel, you convey the message. Now, is everybody on Twitter at this event? No, I heard a no. That's okay. Some of you might not be ready yet to jump into the Twitter pool. Totally fine. The water can be chilly. So what I would suggest for those of you that don't want to jump in yet, you can listen. You can see what all the wacky people on Twitter are saying. You could check out all the brands, see what they're doing, check out other libraries, you know, check out other just institutions. There's all sorts of stuff. And, and the nice thing is, you know, if you want to learn Twitter, if it's not something you've ever really jumped into, Go to a website like business.twitter.com. Strip out the fact in your head that it's, it's, it's on a business website and it's all kind of corporate feeling. And just remember, this is about sort of figuring out how to use Twitter for strategic communications, figuring out how to use Twitter for engagement. And it, you will learn so much in that space. But when it comes to listening, I, I recommend just setting something up like this in an office in your library. Just, you know, a social media listening command center, all you have to have is some blue light and some bottled water and, and about 18 different monitors. You know, but that's actually a bit of hyperbole because all you really need to monitor social media is a monitor and something like TweetDeck. This particular screenshot is of, um, at one point in time, this is some of the columns that I had on my social media dashboard in TweetDeck.com. And I'm following hashtags, notifications. I have sort of a, a stream of, of home stream, uh, all kinds of stuff. And you can search for all kinds of things that people are saying. When I was an academic advisor at Oregon State University, I would search for all types of things related to academic advising. And I would get information from the local community. I would get information from people all over the world and just see sort of what the vibe was like uh, and what resources people were sharing. And I even found out one time there was a student who tweeted out that uh, one of her coaches had written a paper for her. And, and I said, well, that's probably not a good thing. You know, it's, it's amazing what people put out there. Now, I know you've had some sort of some pre-conference stuff or some sort of uh, really specific social media and engagement related sessions, uh, and they, they might have gone over some metrics. Uh, how many of you like data? 
any data fans in the room? Yeah, I, I just, I kind of geek out over data. Um, I ran some ads on Twitter the other day just so I could get some numbers to crunch. I didn't care if I got clicks. I just wanted to see what the data was like. Uh, and and analytics.twitter.com is fantastic. You get all kinds of stuff. You can figure out what people are up to with your with your things that you're sharing. You can see if they're clicking on links. You can see if they're emailing the stuff that you're sharing. Uh, it's it's phenomenal. You can see where people are at, where they're from, uh, who's following you, what they're doing with this stuff. It's it's one of those things where people will say, well, what does success mean? And I always say, you know, success means the people are engaging with you, your, your followers are sort of, you know, your followers or your likes or however, whatever the met, the sort of vanity metric is that everybody looks at, you know, if that sort of is just organically increasing gradually over time and people are connecting with you, that is success. Um, if people say, well, I didn't even know you were on Twitter, I would say that is probably the opposite of success. You want to make sure that people know you're out there. Let them, uh, let them know you're out there on all your print media, let them know on your digital signage, let them know on your email signatures, put your Twitter handle, or your, your social media handle. If it's a blog, if it's a YouTube channel, put it in your emails because you send more emails than you send tweets. Also, I just love things like on LinkedIn, you know, you've got these endorsements. When you're on LinkedIn, and I'm guessing a lot of you are on LinkedIn because you have jobs. Maybe some of you are like, I don't know, man. We're, we're still we're still working on that employability thing. Get on LinkedIn. I know you have a job, but get on LinkedIn and see what people endorse you for, because it'll really sort of shed some light on on sort of the things that people think you're good at, and maybe that's the stuff that you should keep doing, or maybe there's some things you should work on. Uh, this is these are the endorsements on my particular LinkedIn. Uh, apparently, I need to work on my Twitter skills. I'm only at a 23. Um, but I've got uh, you know blogging skills. That's that's good to see. Because at the end of the day, you're sort of building the library brand as well as your personal brand. And you know I think it can be uh, kind of full of moxie and full of sort of some some personality. You know you want to inject something cool into what you're doing. I mean, there's just too many people that are pushing out stuff, right? If you're just pushing out, the library will be open from nine to five today and we offer the following services. That's boring, right? Because you can get that anywhere. You can get that off the website. You know, you want to do stuff with your social channels that actually builds the library's brand as sort of being a multimedia communications powerhouse on campus. And I would say at the end of the day, you all are sort of primed and positioned to be that space at your campus because you know librarians are cool people librarians do good work and yes that's grumpy cat because you know what i figured i need to have at least three cats in in this particular presentation the other thing is mobile engagement I, you know i think there's sort of the the stereotype that libraries are sort of you know this is a fixed thing and you know the only way to access your content or, or people in you know in the library is to, to actually go into the building, but I gotta say you know people are going into the building to get coffee, you know they can access a lot of information digitally, and so you got to think about sort of hey I'm gonna collect a bunch of digital artifacts with my phone and I'm gonna share it with the community. Think about that mobile engagement piece that that sort of what it gives you that extra layer of connectivity with your community on the go on the fly. Uh, this is a, a tweet from JISC, that organization I was talking about earlier, uh, and some of their research, they, and this is obviously UK specific, but um, this is from last February. They said 40% of students use social media as primary means of communication with their lecturer. Uh, that's a lot. And then I just I was doing a, a search for UK students, and I found this one here from Rachel saying that she Twitter stalks her lecturers so bad. Um, you know, it's one of those funny things where 10 years ago, if you'd have come up to me at a conference and said, I've been following you for a really long time, <laughs> I, I would have been a little creep, I would have been a little creeped out, you know? And, and now it's like, oh, you've been following me. Oh, it's on, on Twitter. Great, great. You know, you, you hope it's, it's been on Twitter. Uh, and so, you know, you've got Rachel here saying she's Twitter stalking her lectures. And you think, okay, that's not a bad thing anymore. She's following her lectures. She's seeing what they're up to. She's probably tweeting at them. Maybe she's asking questions. Maybe the next tweet that she puts out is going to be, I Twitter stalk my, our, you know, our librarians so bad. Although, you know, maybe grammatically speaking, because she's English, she should say so badly, but that's okay. We'll just keep going. Also, in addition to, and I know this is kind of 
maybe uh, looking at social media connectivity, uh, especially from a, a librarian perspective, uh, a little bit differently. But I think it goes back to, you know, in, in the sort of employability pipeline that is education. And I, I love education for the sake of learning, for the sake of uh, what it does for humanity. But at the end of the day, most students are going to a university or a college, especially for their undergraduate degrees, to help better their, their ability to get that, that job, that career, that next step in life. And, and I, I wonder what's the sort of um, disruptive thing that librarians and libraries can do with LinkedIn, which is a bit more sort of career services focused, obviously, and sort of what you're doing with careers. But again, it's all about relationship management. So maybe all of a sudden you become the library that is posting your blog posts, your stories on LinkedIn. And you're sort of becoming, hey, it's about knowledge, it's about wisdom, it's about professionalism. It just so happens we're posting our stuff on LinkedIn. And then you could use like the LinkedIn Relationship Manager app, which hasn't gotten a lot of buzz. But what it does is if you've got, you know, 500, 600, 700 connections on LinkedIn, it's really hard to actually keep those connections in such a way that it actually feels like you know everybody. And so what that relationship app does, that's the second icon down there. Uh, it, it allows you to say, hey, good job when someone gets a new prom a promotion or when they, it's their birthday or there's a big life event or they post something that's something that you want to actually engage with. So maybe check that out and think, how could we as a library use this app? Um, and then at the end of the day, what, one of the things I see too in this space, because again, you got to think about strategic communications are sort of in the here and now for the internal community, for the external community and, and sort of, you know, placing seeds for the future, right? So if you're building a community on LinkedIn, you think about people who graduate, right? Because our students eventually graduate. That's kind of the hope. That, that's not as funny as I had hoped it would be, but that's okay. The thing with, like, with LinkedIn is students may give back. If they feel a, a particularly strong connection to their academic library at their institution, you know, they may actually give you all money when they donate instead of maybe giving it to athletics or maybe giving it to their particular major. Um, wouldn't that be kind of amazing? I mean, maybe you have like an entire library full of endowed positions and it's because of what you did with your LinkedIn communications. Or how many of you have checked out Periscope? Speaking of mobile communications, mobile connectivity, raise your hands and hold them up in the air if you've tried it out. I see nobody has tried. Okay, so Periscope is live video streaming. Uh, it's iPhone only right now, uh, but it's it's on the fly live and it's connected with Twitter. And the neat thing about it is um, people can engage with you. They can ask questions. They can put little hearts. If, if they tap on the screen while you're broadcasting video, it puts little hearts on the screen. Um, but then these videos are saved on your phone. You can get this, this archivable video. Um, think about a, a Periscope demo of the library. You know, you could do quick, sort of fast, five-minute walkthroughs or little interviews. If we're going to do today's Periscope interview of this library and or what this particular special collection is all about. There's also Meerkat. Have you heard of Meerkat? Okay, uh, Meerkat is very similar to um, to Periscope. Everybody okay in there? Can you can you see me okay or see the slide okay? Yeah. Okay. You can hear me okay? No Periscope users. Woo. I know. It's it's like, come on now. I, I just said librarians are like disruptive, technologically savvy machines, right? We got to get in there. Now there's also the rise of sort of the geosocial anonymous apps. How many of you have come across Yik Yak? Yeah, and Yikak has caused some trouble at some institutions. Uh, you know, you've seen students posting things. Uh, the way Yikak works is you can only see posts on Yikak that are in a 1.5 mile to a 10 mile radius. So it's very geo-based. It's based on your location and it's completely anonymous except for the fact that they are tracking people's IP addresses. So if they did say something inappropriate that could get them in trouble, uh, you know, obviously law enforcement has been brought in. Well, there's a lot of controversy around Yikak However, during finals week, during the times when you know your life, the library is going to be just at peak capacity. Everybody's, you know, everybody's in the library till like 4 a.m. It's, it's their home away from home. I guarantee you there's going to be a lot of traction and action on Yik Yak. And you should probably go in there and just start posting some stuff about maybe library hours, uh, features, you know, functions, things that you've got going on, uh, special services. 
uh, because Yik Yak is like any other communications tool, is except for the fact that it's it's geolocation based and it's anonymous. But the content of that communication is what we make it, and so you all can get in there just as easily as anybody else. In fact, um, let's see here. I've been following you on Yik Yak. Feels very different than on Twitter. That's true. Well, you can't actually follow someone on Yik Yak uh, because it's anonymous. Uh, some you can add a handle. Um, but even the creators of Yik Yak uh, basically have said we want this to be Twitter but anonymous, and and I'm not sure if we you know at the beginning of the, the sort of the, the social web we began with uh, pseudonyms you know people weren't using their real name you know people were like Purple Dragon 24 on Live Journal, uh, and then all of a sudden it was all about Facebook and real identity and your photo your actual headshot, and now there's this sort of back to maybe a bit more anonymous stuff, um, which. In some ways, I feel like it can be cathartic because there are people who want to share some stuff, uh, like mental health issues, things that they don't want to have their name attached to. Uh, but on the other hand, we've seen some ugly as well. And, and I think that we're still sort of figuring out what we're doing with this whole thing called Yik Yak. But they are coming to your campus if they're not already there. Heck, if you have Yik Yak, Yik Yak on your phone, take a look at it uh, right now because I guarantee you there's some uh, interesting yaks that have been posted in your, your particular area. Whew. Okay, now, lastly, as I finish up with the slide part of this whole presentation, uh, always feel free to experiment, get in your sandbox. I, one of the things that happens to me a lot is I'm, I'm frequently traveling and people will ask me when I arrive at a destination if I've heard of some new site or service or app. And, and you know, sometimes I'm disconnected. I'm disconnected from the internet, it happens. And I just don't know. And, and I, I'll get back to my hotel room or I'll get back to somewhere where I get online and maybe I'll check it out and I'll sort of, you know, play around with this or that. And, you know, you get sort of this experimental mindset that the communications tools are always changing, but the communication aspects aren't. It's just maybe a bit more social. Maybe it's a bit more mobile. Uh, so you're always going to be existing in this space where once you figure out one channel, maybe five or six more come into the pipeline and you say, okay, I'm going to try these other two just to see if they might work for what we're trying to do. Because it doesn't seem like we really get rid of communications channels. Like think about the facts, right? How many of you have sent a fax this year? Yeah, that's pathetic. It's just sad, right? Like we're, it's 2015. We, I, I mean, come on, we've got watches like the Apple watch that can read your heartbeat, but we're still sending faxes. So, Again, think of it this way. The communications tools keep evolving, keep changing, and email is still a viable communications tool. I mean, if you think about it, if you send a quality email and then you also maybe link out to your social channels or maybe on Twitter, you use Twitter as sort of the tip of the iceberg that draws people into a bigger conversation maybe on your blog or it draws people into a conversation in the comments on your YouTube videos. Uh, by the way, quick note about YouTube videos, uh, keep them short and sweet. Uh, maybe 45 seconds to a, a minute in length uh, because the data shows on, on YouTube that things longer than that tend not to be watched uh, completely. You might have a lot of views on a, a particular video, but that video might not actually get people watching from all the way from zero seconds in to nine minutes. They're only watching up to about a minute. Okay, I'd be remiss if I didn't sort of give out a shout out to uh, Inside Higher Ed. Uh, I do write uh, the student affairs and technology blog for insidehighered.com. Uh, the only reason I give a shout out to it is because I was at a NASPA conference a few years ago and I was sitting in the audience and someone from the front of the room said, if only we had a blog about student affairs and technology. And I was sitting in a room full of 50 people and nobody shouted it out, nobody raised their hand, commented about it. So I guess it's, it's gotta be up to me. Now, if you have a question, if, you, if there's something that you know you, you, you think about later or um, you just you don't feel like asking it to this virtual disembodied head that's a, about to appear in front of you, uh, you know, please feel free to email me at ericstoller at gmail.com. I'm posting some stuff every once in a while on ericstoller.com, although most of my stuff is still going to Inside Higher Ed. Uh, and I'm at Eric Stoller on Twitter. Uh, and I'm going to go into Twitter here in a second to see all the, the just amazing stuff that you all have been sharing. Uh, and I think what I'd like to do now uh, is just go into the, the questions and answer portion and go back to um, the video here and we'll just go back and forth uh, in, a, in a conversational mode. Does that sound good? Sounds great. And I think what I'd like to do is 
invite people up to the microphone so that you're on camera and Eric, and Eric has a better sense of who is asking the question. Um, and Eric, we can't see you. Oh, yeah. There you are. No, I'll come, I'll come back. Come back. You know, when you're producing your own thing, you know, you got it's a little slower. You don't have the whole, you know, the whole team. Great presentation. I'm sure we have time for a few questions. I know we're a little bit over time. One thing that has come up uh, the last couple of days is, uh, and you touched on it a lot, really, is how we remain relevant. I mean, platforms are always changing, and um, it's it's difficult. And I think you know you said you have to hustle a little bit, and that's true. But could you talk more about that relevance of uh, finding the right channels for the right audience? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is is building time uh, into your day, into your week, into sort of the organizational structure uh, where it's okay to experiment. It's okay to pilot things. It's okay to have a little bit of failure even. Um, you know, there's this sense that it's got to be perfect right out of the gate. And, you know, that's where you see sort of, hey, look at our new blog. It's amazing. And then there, like three or four posts later, it's just like it's tumbleweeds. There's nothing going on. And, and I think it's because you know maybe it was an experiment, and they, they maybe they could take it down, and, and it doesn't need to exist anymore. But I, but I think the biggest piece of this is building in time, and and being rewarded for that, being rewarded for the fact that you're experimenting, getting senior leaders within the library, within the organization, the institution, uh, to allow for that, um, and to be okay with that. And then the other thing is the the savvier you get, you know, it's like you've you've. Think about it from a scaffolded learner perspective. The, the, the more savvy you get with, say, Twitter, uh, you're going to be better at other social media, so other social networks, because you're kind of already swimming in that space. Uh, you know, the more you listen on Twitter, the faster you get with it. You, you'll, you wouldn't even have to devote as much time. I, I think about people like Santa Ono, you know, University of Cincinnati, or uh, Ken Elmore, the, the dean of students for Boston University. He makes social media look easy. But it's because he's gone through this learning curve. He's, he's gone through this process where at the beginning he wasn't that fast at it and he wasn't that savvy with it. But then you get better over time. You get more mobile happy with it. You're able to just do it on the go and you get more confidence. And the more confidence you have with the platform, it, it shows, right? It comes out that you're, you're more confident about it. You can tell when, when an institutional entity is tentative with, with their social media accounts because it's all push. It's all, hey, here's what we've got going on. There's no engagement. And again, your promotional stuff should be a small percentage of what you're doing. And, and also to get back to the point of how do, we, how do we sort of stay relevant, ask students. Students are people too. You know, talk to them. Uh, talk to each other. And, and the other thing is just don't trust any parents who say, well, my son or daughter, they only use X, Y, and Z. Because then people like to generalize and sort of extrapolate off of that, like it's real data. Great, great. Thanks so much. Uh, and I'm going to pass this off to Aaron. Hi, Eric. I was really glad you just mentioned the role of, of students and their voice. And I know that's something that's going to come up at the conference, um, sort of like how do we create uh, a program or some kind of um, arrangement where students can help us um, extend the extend the reach of our of our messaging. And I was curious if you've seen any models out there that, that you think are particularly effective or if you have tips for people that want to move in that direction. Yeah, I think incorporating students into the mix is, is such a sort of obvious step, right? It's one of those things where why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we use uh, people sort of peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, people that are already in the trenches literally uh, communicating with one another? And I, you know, I found that the institutions that have social media teams of students that say, go create, go forth and, and make good stuff. You've got sort of a loosely defined vision or mission, uh, but we're not going to go in and we're not going to sort of sandpaper polish your stuff. We're going to let you put out your opinions. We're going to let you put out your thoughts. Um, those are the places where it seems like things are happening in a, in, a, in a good way. I know the University of Delaware was just soliciting for some social media savvy students for a, the sort of high level marketing and communications. Um, University of Arizona for several years had some really good student social media work coming out of their, their union, their student union. Um, I, you see a lot of people soliciting or advertising for student bloggers. Um, but if they're asking students to blog and then those blogs eventually just kind of become 
pseudo press relief release type content. It's not really real. It's not actually uh, actual life. You know, you want people to to be able to share quality stuff. You know, I the other thing is when you get students connected to you, sort of your social media efforts and that peer to peer exchange, they're going to share stuff that maybe their observations of what it's like day in day out are things that you just didn't even notice or you didn't even have, you know, you didn't even name it that way. And, and you'll find it's sort of like this uh, ongoing focus group that's doing stuff for you while simultaneously communicating to the community while you're improving things. Thanks, Eric. Is there one more question? Yes, OK, thanks. And you are Shelby from Michigan State. Michigan State. So uh, with the whole Yik Yak thing, um, I've actually, in my institution at Michigan State University Library, I kind of watch my Yik Yak during finals week, and they're all asking, like, where's the therapy dogs and all this, and I'll respond. However, I get this feeling that I'm like a mom when I do that. And when is it inappropriate for a university or a uh, company to be on a media site like that? Yeah, well, first of all, shout out to mobs because, you know, we all have one. We all have one. Uh, it's May is Mother's Day month. Come on. Uh, but I, but I, get your, I get what you're saying, you know, in, in sort of student affairs vernacular, it would be sort of that in loco parentis, you know, in lieu of the parents uh, that used to be sort of the name and game for, for student affairs people back in the day. Uh, and now, obviously, the student engagement piece is much more important. What it reminds me of, though, is it reminds me of when Facebook first came on the scene back in 2004, 2005, 2006. People in, in sort of administrative faculty positions sort of kept their distance and said, you know, that's where the kids are. That's where the students are. We're not going to be in that space. And, and you know, you go to a, a session on Facebook several years ago, and it was just like, how do you log in? What's a username? It was very basic, very surface level stuff, but it's still very popular. People were very interested in this. Uh, and so I think when it comes to Yik Yak, you know what, if you're posting stuff, you're just part of that community. You're just part of that stream, just like you are on Twitter and Facebook. And you know, if students don't like um, what it is that you're posting, which if you're posting about puppies, I'm guessing you're going to get some upvotes on Yik Yak. But if your posts get downvoted, they get downvoted. And you go back in and you keep posting. I mean, the, the interesting thing about Yik Yak, obviously, is funny stuff gets, gets upvoted and it kind of rises to the top. Uh, and sometimes it's not so funny. And that's the stuff that gets uh, sort of upvoted or goes to the top. But that's also, also the stuff that can get downvoted and go down and get eliminated completely. Because once a post, as you know, you know gets um, five negative votes on Yik Yak, it disappears. Uh, and so if students are posting questions, hey, they're not being apathetic. They're, they're posting. They're just not posting in the spaces where we've traditionally gone to answer their questions. And, and it's sort of the, the, the cliche of, you know, we go where they are. We go where the students are. And in this case, uh, a lot of students are on Yik Yak. It's a really popular platform. Same thing goes with Snapchat. Eric? Uh-oh, you're cutting out a little bit on me here. Too much Wi-Fi use. Thank you so on. much. This is joining us. Uh, you, you, can you hear this? I can. I can. I can okay. hear you now. OK. Well, thanks so much. And I'd just like everybody in the room to uh, join me in thanking you for this. And uh, uh, it's been really great. So thanks for closing us out. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care, everyone. I'm going to stop the broadcast now. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Yeah, two Eric's.